on to today. Our speaker today comes to us from Northville, Michigan. She grew up with antique stealers and she's always loved history. In fact, she says she often feels as though she's left over from the last century. <laughs> In 1993, she participated in a 100th anniversary reenactment walk on the Oregon Trail, walking somewhere between 9 and 28 miles every day. She slept on the ground by the wagons at night, and this journey and her love of history inspired her to research life on the Oregon Trail and build up a collection of first-hand accounts and some interesting 1800s artifacts, too many of which that we'll get to see today. Um, she's shared stories of women on the Oregon Trail for 10 years now. Please help me welcome Shirley Weinreich. If I stand here, can you still see the screen? Okay, I didn't realize that, so I sat down over there. Thank you for inviting me. I've, I've been here an hour or so, and I've had a great time so far, so I hope you have a good time. Um, back, as Stephanie said, um, I've always liked history, and um, one day Sunday, I'm reading the Sunday Free Press, and it says, like history, be part of it, they're going to run this sesquicentennial wagon train. I thought, wow, I've always wanted to ride in wagons and do that. So I got a friend to, to, to um, sign up with me, and we paid $34 a day to go do this. And um, we had very specific clothes. All these clothes you see over here are clothes we made because you had to have uh, big pockets because you had no purse, you couldn't wear sunglasses, you um, couldn't have, uh, you had to have a bonnet or a big straw hat. The hat I have down here on the end, I wore, uh, and I love that hat because it has holes in the top and the breezes would blow across the prairies and the sun's beating down and there, it'd be nice and cool because they're the holes in the top. When I came home, I put some flowers on it and hung it on my bedroom wall, so it's kind of fancied <laughs> up, but it used to be just a straw hat. Anyhow, we had to wear pantaloons. If you noticed, I have pantaloons on, and we had to wear them. They sent us patterns for them if you didn't have. Anyway, because we were walking through high grass, and they said there's cat um, not caterpillars, grasshoppers, and lots of bugs and things, and scratched up with branches and stuff. So you never knew. Some days we walked on um, busy roads. First day I walked, we walked on a truck route for um, logs, you know, these big logging trucks. And they, those boys move. And when the State Highway Patrol came that morning and talked to us and said, we're going to walk you really fast today because we don't want you on this road. It's not safe. It's too narrow. So they uh, trotted the horses. And the, it would be, the wagon train would start out. We had a dozen wagons. The wagons went first. Then behind the wagons, horseback riders came. And if you uh, had a horse and you wanted to ride, you paid a different amount and you could ride. And then if you wanted to stay with the camp, like we did, then you paid a little more and you got this little pup tent. And the pup tent was small, really small. You left all your clothes in your car, other than what you're wearing. That was your home base, was your car. You, you did all that. You were ready to leave at seven in the morning, which meant you got up at four. And the mules would wake you up. You'd hear this eong, 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 and the hungrier they get, the louder they get. So that was our alarm clocks. And then they had a semi uh, trailer, and it had steps going up into it. And one side was men's shower, and the other side was ladies' showers. Well, the first day we were there, my friend said, "How do we know which is which?" I said, well, I think it's probably like the roadside rest areas. I think the ladies are always on the left and the men are on the right. And she said, okay, so we start up the steps and we get just near the top step and this bass voice goes, come on in, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wrong. It was the other way around. <laughs> but anyhow, we remembered that and they had uh, sinks there was like six sinks uh, uh, and a, say, Formica top, 
and above them there were mirrors, and these were on an arm that swung under the truck when they were traveling, and then when they parked, they would open up and they must have connected it to a water tank or something, and that's where you brushed your teeth and did your hair and all the things you do at a sink. And one I had wearing, I was wearing um, contacts that just covered the pupil of your eye at that time. And we had this high grass, and I dropped a contact. And it had been a bad night. We had got there, this is when we went back out to Oregon. We walked the first week uh, in Idaho. That was the 4th of July week, it started. And we had such a good time, we didn't want to come home. We really, everybody did. There were nurses there with us from Baltimore, and they didn't want to leave either. Nobody wanted to go to the airport. Anyhow, so we said, we'll all come back the last week and walk in together. And we did, and we had a great time. But um, so anyhow, um, we got, when we went back, they had lost our reservation. They didn't have any place for us to stay. We didn't have a tent, and so um, they, nobody seemed to know anything. So we found an empty tent, and I said to my friend, let's just put our stuff in here. It's an empty tent, you know, nobody's using it. So we just get it settled in, and they said, oh, oh, you have to move out this, the winery that is sponsoring, one of the sponsors, they've reserved this tent. You can't stay in this tent. And I said, well, we don't have a place, and we came all the way from Michigan, and, uh, you know, I'm disgusted. And the fellow says, what's your name? How do you spell it? Well, like a dummy, I spelled it for him. So he goes away and he comes back and he said, you have a tent down there. It's at the end of the line. So we gather up our stuff and take it down. And here's this little bitty tent with somebody scribbled in crayon, wine rank. <laughs> <laughs> that was my tent. So we couldn't fit in it. Our, our, our cots were too big, so we had to sleep with our feet sticking out the front door. And we were down by the mules, too, and they were hee-hawing at us. And so my friend, she, she's very mellow, real sweet lady. And I had lost my patience, and I have a temper when I get tired. And I, and I said, and they said, the television station's going to be here in the morning, so we have all these television people here. And I said, oh, I hope that uh, I get to talk on television, because why I want to tell them what I think of their accommodations here. <laughs> so needless to say, nobody let me anywhere near the TV cameras. But anyhow, oh, that was what I was going to tell you. That was the way it started. Then I had locked the keys. We had an SUV, didn't, had never driven an SUV. We had our bedrolls and all of our stuff in the back of the SUV. Got out and locked the doors and locked my keys in the car. So then I had lost my contact lens over at the sink. It was just a bad night. So um, I'm, <laughs> I'm crawling through the back on the tailgate in these outfits, trying to pull myself like this over the sleeping bags and all the equipment we had. And my friend comes and my feet are kicking out the back and she's, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> she said, you look like you're trying to swim up to the driver's seat. And I said, I lost the key, the key's locked in the car. Anyhow, so she said, I'm going to go look for your contacts. And I said, you're not going to find them. It's big high grass. And she said, oh, I find four-leaf clovers all the time. And I thought, she's such a Pollyanna. She's always so nice and <laughs> thinks the best of everybody and never gossips or anything. <laughs> so she's the good angel that follows me around or keeps after me. Anyway. Um, so she goes, and I'm still struggling, trying to get to the wheel. And she comes back, and she's got her hand like this, and she goes, is this it? And she had found it in the high grass. But isn't that amazing? So God was shining down on me, even though I was screwing up every way. <laughs> but anyhow, that's one, that's one some of our, um, how we got involved in it. And we kept, kept um, in touch with several of the people we walked with. For years, we had a, a couple from Cooley Dam, Washington. We had these nurses from uh, Baltimore. We had people from Oregon. There were people from all over the country. It was just like one big family. We just loved it. So anyhow, that's when I came home. We first came home, the Chesening Library. My friend lived in Chesening. They wanted us to come and talk, and um, we went. But we were both working, and it was a weeknight, and you know, we had to haul everything up there and then come back home. So we decided just to let it go until we retired. 
And so she did a few of them with me, but now she's uh, down in Key West winners. So <laughs> and I tried to get her to come up and she said, no, she's coming up a little bit later when it starts getting real warm down there. But uh, um, so it was still, it was a great experience. But anyhow, to get, get to the business, somebody asked me why they were going out there. Well, you've all heard of the Northwest uh, Territories. You know, um, Jefferson made this great deal with France to buy them. And uh, then we had this land, and the, up at a place called Mackinac Island, there was such a good fur business going. They were selling so many furs to England because beaver hats were the big thing overseas, and they were just making a fortune. So the, the British uh, fur traders were talking about moving farther out west in Canada. If, you know, if it's this good here on the lake, why wouldn't it be good farther out? We could just keep opening more trading posts, more trading posts, and we'll make a real killing. So Washington got word of that, and they started thinking, we have fought the British how many times? Two, three times already, and we're going to have another war on our hands if they go out and settle in our Northwest Territory. We're going to have to get them out of there. So uh, Jefferson came up with this, we've got to do something to get people to move out there. So they offered um, a square acre, or a square mile of land, which I think is like 30, 30, acre, uh, 30 acres. I'm not sure, I forgot my book at home that had the exact things. But anyhow, it's, imagine the mile roads here from Livernoy over to, um, what's the Crooks, the last one back there, from Big Beaver up here to, to um, Waddles. All that would be your farm. And, and any U.S. citizen, if he was a, a male, he could get to the 36 uh, square mile. Uh, uh, um, and if he was, uh, was married, he got an extra one. His wife didn't get it he got an extra one because he had a wife. So these men, uh, then in those days, the word went, you know, they go out here, I don't know, is your closest mill right, Romeo, or out right that way somewhere here, do you have a, a mill um, that grinds things? Oh, yeah. And so they would take their corn and their wheat there to get it ground, and like a typical men anywhere, they'd sit around and visit because they had to wait in line and while they're waiting, they discussed everything going on. Well, in those days, there was, there was just the newspapers and word of mouth, and so that's where they learned things. So he came home, and he was all excited. They're giving away all this free land out there. And meanwhile, back in the East, people were, um, there was several things. There was a, a depression, people were losing their farms. There was, um, people had settled in Kentucky and Tennessee and it wasn't any good for farming. It was rocky and too steep. They couldn't really make good pastures and fields there. And in Missouri they had swamps and a lot of children were dying from a fever that was around because of the swamps. So people were uh, unhappy about a lot of things. So that's when the idea of moving west started. That's how it got started. And it would take, um, you'd have to spend like, he came home and he said to his wife, you know, it's a good deal. We're going to pack up and go and we're going to have all this land and we're going to have this huge farm. And it would be like your husband coming home and saying, we're going to pack everything we have in the minivan because the wagons were only 10 by 6. They were very short, very small. And we're going to walk for three months, well, actually it was six months, and you had to walk because nobody fit in the wagon because the wagon was chock full of food and tools and things. Maybe if they had grandma or grandpa, they would fix a little place for them. But even the babies didn't ride because they found the babies, if they put the babies in there, it was so rocky and the trail was so many ruts because nothing had ever passed over it except uh, a wild animal, game, and uh, maybe an Indian tribe or so. 
anyhow, um, the babies would bounce out and the wagons were lined up, the wagon behind it would run over the baby before they could get to it. So they didn't dare put the babies in there because that's, they would be out. There were a lot of, children had a lot of accidents. It, they went so slow, the kids would walk, jump on the wagon while it was moving if they wanted something out of there and then jump back off. And a lot of times they would fall and get ran over and have broken legs and, and sometimes worse injuries. So it was a very hazardous place for children. I'm going to work on a program this next uh, few months on children because I didn't think I had enough material about the children, but I'm finding out more and more things about how it affected them. But um, anyway, uh, so here's the poor wife. She has nothing to say about it. She's going to have to leave her family, you know, her, her mother and sisters and her extended family, and um, she's going to have to leave her the cemetery if she has babies or children that have died. She's never going to come back. It'd be like going to the moon. It would be, you know, I'm just, you're going to go there and we're just going to make a whole new start. And she didn't have anything to say about it because in those days women didn't have any um, say. They just, you know, anyhow. Um, so he would get busy and he would be fixing over the wagon. He'd be brightening, sharpening the tools, doing things like that, raising uh, corn and stuff to take. She and the girls would be uh, drying out fruit and vegetables. They took a lot of dried stuff. Um, they would be sewing, making, um, knitting socks and sweaters and things like that, making quilts, because they would go in the spring. So they leave here in March, and you know what Michigan's like in March, and they'd be walking, and they would walk behind that wagon to Missouri, They'd walk to St. Louis, they'd walk to Independence, Missouri, they would walk to Council Bluff, Iowa. Those were what they called jumping off places. And that's where the wagon trains formed, and that's where you sold your horses and you bought oxen. And that was another fun thing, because a lot of these oxen had never been broken to a yoke, and so sometimes it would take them a good part of the day to get them both in the yoke, because they were frisky young a male cow or bulls. Anyway, um, then they would buy up there like 100 pounds of flour and uh, 50 pounds of coffee and the things like that that they had to buy. And I think um, in one of your handouts there, I'm not sure if uh, that's the one I brought. That's all right. Um, it tells some about, um, oh, it's the one that tells all about the different recipes and stuff. like. Uh, coffee they bought and stuff like that. And I don't think we have it on there, but people have asked me, well, how did they carry eggs? And they carried it in a barrel with sawdust and they'd buy like a hundred eggs. And they'd, they'd carry them in the sawdust and when they thought they were getting kind of old, then they'd boil them and they'd carry them as hard boiled eggs. But that's what they did for eggs. And uh, butter, was easy. Butter, they just took the jar of milk and tied it to the wagon and juggle, 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 and they had butter by nighttime. And, and uh, people in this organization that belong to the Oregon Trail Association, they have camp outs and things, and they've tried it. They said it works great. They just tie it on their wagons and, and it just it makes butter for you. Anyhow, um, so that was them getting started, I don't, I'm surprised any went or made it because you think it would be um, just, you know, everybody would have something happen to them, but they uh, did. So I don't know, where'd Joanne, oh, you back there? Oh, okay. Am I blocking view here? Let me see. Um, yeah, the, oh, the women, that was an amazing thing, too. You saw on there what the women had to do. They were a little bit busy. And then at night, they would still find time to sit by the fire with a pen, and with a, just a quill, and their diary. And I had a, um, I don't know if I brought it, a diary that, um, of, they were leather. And they would write in there with this quill 
there were dates, and as it got longer and longer, in the latter years of the Oregon Trail, they mostly wrote how many graves they passed, because so many of them were dying. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason they died, and they didn't know it, was they had, um, they, were, they were very environmental. Everybody, they had these books like this that are, um, they've sold them. And it was like the salesman on TV, you know, you had to get one of these because it had all the latest routes and told you exactly where to go and everything. Half the time, the people that wrote the books had never been out there. And so it was just a scam, but they had these books. And so they would tell you, you go up here and you stop like five miles down and park there for the night. And then you go another 10 miles and you stop there. Well, the books all said the same thing. So each one wagon train that came along went and stopped there. And you had um, the, the um, people walking, you know, the uh, people that were on the train. Then you had the horses, the, the oxen, because the men had horses they were riding, some of the men, uh, oxen. Um, they had um, cattle, a lot of them brought cattle. Some of them even brought sheep and they'd have them walking behind them. But all this is polluting the trail. And they're all dumping all this in the streams. They're washing their clothes in the stream. They're all going to the bathroom. And that's another thing is, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of my story. I'll tell you a little later. Anyway, uh, it got very polluted. And they started getting sick and dying. And it, they had cholera. And in the morning, you'd be feeling kind of punk. By noon, you'd be getting really sick. By nighttime, you were in terrible pain. And you were lucky if you lived to the next morning. It was that fast. And so uh, near the end, um, it lasted, let's see, from 1843 to, I think, 1858, or, 19, or 1858, um, in that short span, they um, um, had so many people dying that uh, they just, it, it was, um, they, couldn't, they couldn't understand it. You know, they'd have doctors and they'd send back for a doctor, and by the time the doctor got up there, the uh, uh, person would be gone. So um, finally, I don't know, someone must have figured it out or they just, people quit going because it was too risky. But the same, you can imagine how that ground would be chewed up and, and all the waste left over. But um, that's what did it in, if they had only known. But anyway, um, so anyhow, they start out and they're, they're going and the woman, besides having at night having to write her um, diary, um, she had, you saw her list of chores she had to do. She was a busy gal. And, and one of the things um, was I impressed me was all the stuff she had to do with the fire. They had, um, let's see, I'm looking here for my, my cow chip. Yeah. This is plastic, but this represents a cow chip, which you find in the barnyard. And they're really soft and mushy and smelly when you find them. It's cow poop. And they burned these. This is because on the plains, there was no trees. They're going across Iowa and all those places, and there's no trees. So what do they use? They use these because there's nitrate in them and dried, they burn real well. And they would gather them if they, they I have a picture of a woman with one in them. Oh yeah, she, she has a wheelbarrow full here. Whoops. Um, can you see around me there? Um, but that's not a very authentic picture because they didn't have wheelbarrows out there then. So we think that she posed for that one. But that's, it took two and a half bushels for a fire. So, and, it, and if you noticed on your list, at night she had to get the ones gathered for the morning fire too because she'd have to get up at four o'clock and get that fire going so they could eat. That's why I say I like to talk about the women because they were the real heroines of this trip because they uh, really, I'm surprised any of them made it and, and, and stayed there. <laughs> To, to leave their man and came back, but I guess you know they couldn't get back. But anyway, this is what the chip is. Um, 
I bought it out west, it was a Frisbee, but it says here, a genuine buffalo product from Custer State Park, South Dakota. And sometimes if there's kids, I'll say, here, catch. And then I go, that's buffalo poop. And they go, oh. <laughs> but anyhow, um, talking about, while we're talking about the, uh, the cooking and stuff, they, they didn't have ovens. I, I thought they had a, a sheet metal oven. I had read about that. And they tried it, but they, they were too flimsy and they fell apart and broke up then. So this was their oven. I don't know if any of you are campers and you uh, go camping. Do you ever cook in the Dutch oven? Well, they're heavy. This is the top, very, very heavy. Anyhow, and it's a big stew pot, but you can bake in them. They would make biscuits, put the biscuits in there, get the fire roaring underneath, put coals up here on the top, this ridged area, and so you had fire going from the top, fire coming up from the bottom, and that's how you baked. You could make a pie in there, you could make cakes in there, and it would, it would uh, that's why they, this, this was their kitchen. The Dutch oven, the coffee pot, and the frying pan. That's all they needed. And then they had tin plates they ate on, but um, they didn't carry any dishes because they would have broke, and they uh, ate that. But, uh, but she always had to have that backlog of, of, um, of either, well, there was no chance of wood because there was no, no wood around. So, um, let's see what we got. Well, this is again the map, shows from uh, back in, in uh, Missouri where they uh, would start out. And now you notice there's kind of three climates. From Missouri, when you think about Missouri, it's flat. It's not real hot. It's not real cold. It's just kind of in between. And that, so, and it was spring, and they started out in the spring. They started in March, and probably be April when they were out there. And the flowers are coming out, and the birds are singing. It's pretty nice. It's not bad. Except if you have to go to the bathroom, there's no trees. So where do you go? The men don't care, they'll just go anywhere. But yeah. <laughs> the women, so they had what they call the necessary circle. And they would stand, they would usually have it in the evening, and they would uh, visit a certain time, and they would go kind of off to the side somewhere, and they would stand in a circle, they'd have to have at least three or four, and they'd hold their skirts out wide, and they would take turns, one at a time, would go back in the circle, and do her business and then come out and then she'd take her place in the circle so that the others would that Can you imagine waiting all day to go when it was necessary circle? But that, it bothered me for the longest time. I didn't know uh, how, uh, that really puzzled me and it's hard to find out sometimes. And so uh, then when I found out it, it made sense, but. Did you dig a hole? No, I don't think they had time to dig a hole. There was, yeah, there was just, they were too tired. <laughs> the, men, the men wouldn't dig a hole. But anyway, they had, um, uh, the, um, that was one of the things the women had so hard. Besides the hard work, they worked so hard. Um, but then I was going to say, I told you, I'd tell you about um, a love romance. So there was, there were a lot of weddings on the Oregon Trail because if you were a big family and you had money, you could take a lot of uh, to wagons, but you needed people to drive them. So just like we have Teamsters here, they had Teamsters in those days, young men who would hire on and they would drive your wagon for you. So these young men would be like anywhere from 16 and the early 20s and things. And there were a lot of young daughters on the train. So if a girl was 14, she was eligible to get married. If she got to be 16 and still wasn't married, she was getting kind of old. So if you have children or grandchildren 14, next time you look at them, think about being a wife out of there in the, in the wilderness and all the things they had to go through. But the... Um, uh, one of the, I was reading, there's diaries over here. These diaries are so interesting because it's their thoughts at the end of a long day and some of them 
are amazing. Anyhow, this one girl had just found out she was pregnant again. And she said, oh, and she was writing in her diary, she said, is this the time I die? And she was only like 20. And with, you know, the births were so hard and they were out there by themselves. And that was, you know, pretty much happened a lot of times. And then the babies would be passed around. The other women would nurse the babies. And um, the, if the, if the uh, um, baby died, then you know, the mother would just go on. But they uh, took care of each other. The women tried to stick together and, and help each other. But uh, that was a terribly hard life for them. Anyhow, with that, so if, say, we got this young, cute-looking teamster over here, and he's got his eyes on Susabelle over here, and they decide to get married, well, then they would have a wedding. The captain of the wagon train could marry them. He was like a judge. And so he would marry them, and they'd have a big, like, a dinner and party. And they would pull, I thought this was kind of cute, they would pull the bridal wagon off to the side by itself to give them privacy. And they would pull them over there for the next couple of nights. Well, one of those nights, they would have a chivalry. And does anybody know what a chivalry is? <laughs> OK, chivalry, for those who don't know, is you go to bed, and you're getting ready for bed, and your neighbors all come with tin pie plates and things and spoons and bells and whistles and they raise this big ruckus outside until you let them in and give them something to eat or drink. And it's kind of a way of initiation for the couple. But they would, in all their work and stuff they had to do, they had time to have a chivalry whenever anybody got married. But I thought that was kind of interesting. And they had a lot of um, couples who were older that would get married because They'd start out, and maybe the man couldn't swim. A lot of the men couldn't swim. They came from farms back here. They didn't have water nearby. They never had to swim. They get out there, they have to cross these big rivers like the Missouri and the Platte and all these different rivers. So they have to swim with the animals to get the horses, or the, well, it would be the, the um, uh, oxen, uh, started to get them across, and the husband would drown. Now, she didn't want to go in the first place. And here she's got five, six kids and this wagon, and she's out in Kansas somewhere. So she had to scramble around and try to find the husband quick. And then a lot of times, a man would have several children, and his wife would die in childbirth. So there was need for a, a, a companion. A, 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 you needed a mate. So they had a lot of weddings because um, you know, they needed each other. But let's see what else we have. Oh, this is crossing, this is crossing um, the Snake River, and this is up in Idaho, and I've been there, and I saw a drowning when I was there. And uh, it's, they're, they're not going to do it anymore, but they used to do every summer a reenactment of a wagon train crossing the river. And I was so excited because I'd always wanted to see one. And I never could get there the right weekend. So we were there this, this was a couple years ago. And they had been practicing for it. And the wagon master was telling us that they had had a horse go under. And I understand that when horses um, they swallow a lot of water, they can't get water in their, I guess it would be, I don't know if it's their throat or what calling on a horse. But anyhow, it blocks their weight area access to breathe. So he had this horse, and he had gotten the horse out, and he had put $2,000 into vet bills just that week trying to save this horse, and he still didn't know if he was going to save it. So that was the leader telling us that. So we're sitting on the bank. Um, we're over on that side where the, they're coming out, looks like. Yeah, over on the far right side. And there's this PA system. The horses come down the way these are, and they cross the big island, they cross the second one, and they're getting over by the third one, and they're up at the far end, um, closest to, to Joanne here. And all of a sudden, you see this one horse kind of going sideways. And then you see him go under, and the announcer on the PA system is screaming over the PA system, 
get off your horse, get off your horse, fella, get off your horse, because the horse was going to take the rider under with him. So he got off, and they had down here around that curve in the back, they had the Coast Guard, and they had jet skis and all these things in case there was an accident so they could get up there right away. Well, they didn't get up there fast enough. And this, it was a mule that this fellow was riding. And so we watched and watched, and we never saw him come up. Well, then we went to dinner that night, and we heard at the restaurant that, that he had surfaced somewhere way down, but he was um, gone. And they, so they were talking then about stopping doing the demonstrations because they said it was just too dangerous. But the river is so fast, it's the Snake River, that they white water raft in, and it's really treacherous. So back in the pioneer days, that was a big fear for them to have to cross that. As you imagine, you're all the way out there in Idaho, you know, you've got a good part of your journey over with, and then to lose, either lose everything or lose your family. You know. and, and I didn't realize the impact of it until I actually saw it, and, and it just really kind of sunk in. But anyway, let's see what else we got, Joanne. Oh, this is farther, as you get farther west, this is up near Park City, Utah. And look at the stones in there. <laughs> we, we couldn't even walk, we tried to walk down in there. And uh, they, were, they were gonna try to clean it up. But they have some of the places, it would take them all day to get up right over one hill, just it was so steep. I saw a picture the other day I'm going to put in my other films. It shows them, they've taken the top off of a wagon and they've got the wheels down below off this cliff and they're trying to slide the top of the wagon down onto the wheels. And there's about a six foot difference between. That's some more of that same creek. These are hand carts. Anybody ever heard of hand carts? The Mormons. The Mormons had a lot of people that came over from uh, Scotland and England, and they didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have enough money to outfit a wagon and horses and their oxen. And so they would have these hand carts, and they would get them in St. Louis. They would come by boat to St. Louis, and then they'd get these, ox these hand carts, and they would push, like you would push a wheelbarrow, See the two straight boards? You pushed along there, or you could pull it. And uh, I was reading one diary of this one man, and he had a hand cart, and he had some young boys. And I don't know, he didn't have a wife, I guess. Anyway, um, he switched with the boys. He said, okay, I'll push for a while, you pull. And he went to the back of the wagon, and uh, it's all banged up in the back along the boards. And he's looking at it, and he, so he stopped and he said to the boys, what happened back here, that, the woods, it's all knocked apart. And they said, oh, we were so hungry, we were chewing on it while we pushed. Oh <laughs> so they didn't have much, that's why they only had a small thing, but when, uh, they have a big um, holiday out in uh, Salt Lake City when they have handcart festival and they, celebrate and have a lot of wagon trains and things going. <coughs> oh, that's, that's one of the passes they had to go through. Because, you know, you just... Now these people, can you imagine, these are people from Michigan that just you <laughs> got up and went and were together. Yeah, they had no idea this was coming. It was like, <laughs> it is, it's too far to come back. You can't, oh, this is, these are, this is in Wyoming. I've stood in these tracks. There's places where they're taller than I am, and it's through the limestone, and the, all the wheels from the wagons have worn it down, and no joke, it was this high. There, that's the one I stood in. Oh, this one, I like this one. This lady, Standing here in the front, right over Joanne there, I could say, whatever it takes, they should title this, because she's holding onto a horse, she's got a little burro or donkey back here, she's got a cow on the other side, she's got a cow in the back, and I think there's another donkey or something on the other side of the cow. 
And it's not kosher, but she got there, and that's why she's having her picture taken, because she was so proud she made it. Oh, this is in the 1800s. Yeah, this is an old one. That's just some pictures of the trail. That's it? Okay. Oh, that's the trail today. Up, that's up in Oregon, up in the Blue Mountains. And it's pretty, pretty up there. And it's real quiet and these big trees. And we were walking. That's the trail. And we were walking. And then we said, how do you know this is a trail? And they said, because there's notches on the trees. You should you follow the notches. And we kept looking, we didn't see any notches. And it's, they said, you got to look higher because the trail had worn down. And here the notches were up about, looked like about 10 feet. But see how it kind of goes down? And then we were down in the, 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 uh, where it had been worn down. But it's real pretty up there. If you ever get out that way, Blue Mountains, if you're ever up around Baker City, is the most fantastic big museum about the Oregon Trail. They have wagons there you can crawl in and out of. They have things for kids that they have to put together and decide whether they're going to take candy or potatoes or whiskey or what they're going to pack in their wagon with blocks. And they have storytellers. And that one tape we were playing were singers from there. They, they put on skits. And then they have about a five-acre parcel and we walked down, the museum's up on the top of the hill. We walked down this long trail, and it was over 100 that day. And we, had, um, we had, didn't have our walking shoes on. We had tennis shoes on because we were driving. So we got down there, and uh, there's signs all along the trail. Beware of rattlesnakes. Watch for rattlesnakes. So we're walking. We get down there, and there's a bench down there. So we sit down at the bench and rest where we start back up. And this fellow comes with this little cart and says, do you ladies need a ride? Because he thought we couldn't, couldn't make it back up the hill. And we said, no, we're just resting. We're going to come back up. So we, we, uh, he leaves. And we start walking. And I don't know, do we have that last picture? Well, that's some more of them. Oh, no. I had a picture that uh, we, got, we got our tapes mixed up today coming out. So I don't have it in this tape. Um, Anyhow, Dorothy's standing there, and I'm taking her picture, and here going across the trail is the snake. <laughs> but anyhow, that was, oh, can you go back that little, that's the sinks there. Whoops. Yeah, that's the, the, the showers and the sinks. See how they swung out from under the, the trucks we had, we had big semis, and they had beautiful murals painted on them of wagons and mountains and, Whoever, the wagon, the man that served as the um, uh, captain of the wagon train owned a truck line, so I think they were probably his <laughs> trucks. Yeah, but he, he also, um, they got to um, just, it was just by the capital of Idaho, I can't think of the name of it right now, Bo yeah, Boise. Um, and his, his team ran away and uh, rolled his wagon and he broke both hips. Oh and he stayed on the wagon train, he wouldn't go home. And he stayed in oh. crutches. And I have news clips of him uh, at the, they, when they had a big celebration when they got to Boise. And uh, he's there on his crutches. And, uh, but uh, his, what happened, we'd be, you'd go walking down the road, and if there were horses in a pasture, no matter, they could be way far back. If they hear the horses coming, they would come racing up to the fence. And you'd think they were coming right through. They'd just come galloping up there. And they'd run along the fence with us, winning at the horses we had. And then as far as they could go, and then when the fence stopped, they would stop. And after we went on, they'd be winning. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, they're, come back, come back, or I don't know what they were telling them, but then, and I think that's what happened to him. He had mules, he was pulling his wagon, and some horses were in the pasture next to the road, and somehow something spooked the mules, and they went down over the ditch and rolled the wagon, and that's how he got hurt. But um, generally, it was real safe. <laughs> That's our dining hall. Since so she would put wildflowers on the table sometimes. 
we ate breakfast and dinner there. We had a <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when we were out walking, we had lunch, we sat on the ground. And that's the chow line. That's uh, the car cooking crew. They were all guys, but the, the hostess. And she had these crazy costumes. But uh, and that's, that's the day I didn't wear my deodorant. That's me standing there in the middle with nobody near them. <laughs> but that's in the evening. They would have like folk singers or a bluegrass band or maybe an Indian tribe would bring some dancers. They had some kind of entertainment. And people from town, the nearest towns, would come out and they'd interview us and visit with us and uh, ask why we came from Michigan. They couldn't figure that out. Are these your tents? Oh yeah, that's our tents in the back. That was some of them. We had those teepees and then they held two people. And then we had a little uh, pup tent and we almost got ran over in outside of Portland just, just before the end. Um, they couldn't drive it with lights on at night, no lights on your car. And so we were tired, we went to bed, and the show was still going. And the um, next morning I get up, and like I said, I had contacts, but uh, didn't have men. So I put on my glasses to look, look out, and I see this big shiny thing like this. And I'm like, what is that? That wasn't there last night. And I'm looking and I said to my friend, Dorothy, what is this by our door? There's some smell, silver metal thing. And she goes, I don't know, I didn't hear anything. We open the car and it's a hubcap. Somebody is that close, they almost drove over us in the night. Oh He's right up against, so we start screeching, you know, what? <laughs> and, was, and I'm trying to get my glasses on to get out there and tell him, and he must have heard us. And he must have been sleeping in the truck. It was a pickup truck. Oh. And all of a sudden we heard it start up and leave. Oh. But was that frightening? This, I couldn't figure out what this big metal thing was. Oh, this is, we had, at night they would have campfire and they'd have peop, acts come in. We had uh, bluegrass bands. And this particular, look at the backdrop. Isn't that pretty? It looks like painted scenery. And that's all natural stuff. That's campers and things. For the people that had horses, a lot of them brought campers and they just stayed in their campers at night. But um, that one, we had a Czechoslovakian folk singer, who, or cowboy singer, and he sang Western songs <laughs> and, in Czech. <laughs> and so we'd have home on the range, and we knew it was home on range from the melody, but it's all just all the southern. And he was really nice, but it was so funny. That's that's the check. That's the yeah. That's the check. The man in the banjo with the black hat. He's a ranger. We had a lot of, several park people from the park service and stuff that traveled with us. I was uh, in a wagon. And somebody came on and said, who on here is from Michigan? And I said, I am. And he said, I was in Michigan last week. He said, do you know where 12 Mile and Middle Belt is? I said, I live at 9 Mile, <laughs> one, three miles south of there. I said, my son goes to school right there, 12 Mile and Middle Belt. He said, we were there visiting my cousin. <laughs> and he was from, he was a ranger from Idaho. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Small world. Oh, these were some of the kids. We didn't have too many kids. It was not much fun for kids because no. it was a lot of walking. Everybody said, I bet the kids loved it. No, there was not much to do. That's the two of us. We, that was at the end of the trail. And we we're standing there. Somebody asked us if that was our ages on our pockets because... <laughs> <laughs> but that's my friend Dorothy on the right and me on the left. And this is, they had this big powwow. They had uh, an Indian village that had, they had made, showed uh, them making one of these um, houses, the, the ones that the, the whole family slept in. And they had Indian dancers, and they had country music singers, and uh, um, all sorts of things. I think there were 4,000 people walked in with us that day. And it said Oregon City, just outside of Portland. Oregon City was the first capital, and that's, uh, See, oh, that's the two of us standing there with our things on, and that was a mountain man's camp. And that's so they we had our stuff on, so they said, "Well, wear your outfits and get in the picture." And these, I think there's eight. 
They brought the gal on the end, the first one. She's one of the nurses from Baltimore. She walked the whole, these eight walked the whole thing. And the little man on the other end, he was in his 80s. And he had walked, the, oh, this, these eight walked the whole thing. But um, the gal, the nurse from Baltimore, it was cool because her first week, she had like her mother walking with her and then uh, for two weeks, and then her aunt came, the mother went home, and then another sister came. So she always had somebody from her family there, but she went the whole way. Oh, this is the place where we uh, um, were walking with the, and then the, uh, down in the, that's the walk. And this is the one the snake is, down here, right at the bottom of the picture, uh, see about oh, a quarter of the way in. There's a, looks, right. I'm on the, the right side. See, it looks like a stick. It kind of goes up like that. <laughs> we didn't think there were any snakes around. Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of snakes. That's the end. That's the end of that. But does anybody have any questions? I have a question for you. Sure. So you see the when you did this. Yeah. The original ones? Yes, they did. They had tents, and that was uh, part of the thing, too. She set it up. She said, oh, I didn't show you my underwear. Um, <laughs> so the women the tents as well? Yeah, the, they, all, they had tents, um, the whole family, and they, in the, the plains, they ran it with spring, so they ran into a lot of water and a lot of rains, and so everything would get soaked, and so they would have to sleep on the wet bedding until they could have a warm spell where they could get it dried out. Oh what did the men do? <laughs> That's what some The men, um, well, one thing the men had to do, they took turns, you know how they say they circle up the wagons, and then they didn't circle it up because of the Indians. They circled it up to put the horses and uh, the valuable livestock within the circle. The regular cows and calves and stuff, they would take them maybe half a mile away and uh, the men had to take turns on night guard and so that they wouldn't be stolen. And so the men would go and at four o'clock in the morning they'd fire off pistols and that meant night guard was over. They were coming back in and time to get up and that's when the wife would get up and she had to get her fire going and then, and then if you notice on that sheet, one of the things was dry out the, the bedding and all that. But um, they said that the men slept, uh, and they had a lot of babies, you know, on the thing. So I think they weren't shy. They, they did, uh, <laughs> but um, they had, in the morning when the wife would get up, she would have to, um, she would have worn a shift, here's the shift, uh, for night, for uh, her nightgown. And this is the type of shift they would have worn. So, yeah, and it buttoned down the front. And she just, she just wore that. They didn't wear bras. This just, is a nightgown or Well, this is a nightgown or shift. They wore it nights as a nightgown. And during the day, they used to, first they took it off. And then during the day, they wore it for slip. Because they only took three dresses. There wasn't any room for anything more than three dresses. And those three dresses got pretty th threadbare by the time they end. And plus they had to be dark colored because so they wouldn't show the dirt. So anyhow, but they'd have the dress and then this. And then I didn't know at the turn of the century women didn't wear underpants. That, that was, and I never knew. And they didn't have tampons either. <laughs> no, she didn't have a lot of things. <laughs> they just had old rag, rags. They used rags and they'd, they'd, they'd soak them in the river. In the, yeah, and it had leaves. Yeah, yep. All right. Here's here's the the, the um, pantaloons. Oh, okay. Yeah, here. I'm getting tangled up in there. Thank you. I could have put it back up there. I guess. Okay. Here's the pantaloons, and okay. Now, when they had to go to the bathroom. They just did a little squat. Oh <laughs> that was <laughs> because they didn't have time to take all this down. And where would they have put it anyway? The ground was dirty. Oh so this, is, this was their, and when I do this in a mixed one with a lot of men, they all hoot and holler at this because thank you. Uh, 
sexy. But well, that's, 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 well, that's what I say. Yeah. This is the first Fredericks of Hollywood. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but they're up here if you want to come look, look at any of this, any of this stuff over, because I think it's time for me to get off. Uh, yes? I don't know. I don't think so, because uh, it went, went to the, um, you know, he got double land if he was married, but she didn't get any credit for it. He got, he got twice as much. I don't, I don't think they could either. She had to find another man that had land. Yeah. That would be the thing they would do. Yes? Well, some did, but that was a problem because a lot of them couldn't shoot and they had a lot of injuries because they would shoot each other. Because so, <laughs> some of these people were from little towns. They never had gone hunting. They, if they didn't live near a river or a lake, they didn't know how to swim. That's why so many, a lot of the men died crossing the rivers because they'd have a big river like the Missouri River or something that might be half a mile wide. And uh, they've got to swim along, and they would swim holding onto the wagon, trying to guide you know, the horses. The cows would probably swim by themselves, but the horses, they wanted to keep them with their heads up and things because of the problem that they had in Idaho. Anyhow, um, and if he got tangled up or something, a lot of the men drowned swimming when they were crossing rivers. And then the wife is stranded out there with nine kids and nothing to do. Yes. Uh, did they trade with the Indians, or did they have anything to trade with? Yeah, the women, the women got along fine with the Indians. The women traded, and they brought um, uh, moccasins from them because the women wore their shoes out. And then when they got out in um, uh, eastern Oregon, the Indians would bring them fish from the Columbia, and they, uh, they, uh, you know, w women dealt better with the Indians than the men did. No, I don't know her story, but she might have had maybe, yeah, maybe he had just died or something. Maybe, uh, or, yeah, I don't know what her story was. That was just a picture that was in one of the books. Oops. Let's give Shirley a hand real quick. Oh, thank you. You've been a fun audience. You've been very nice. <laughs>